Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, Understanding Semantic Data Center Security. My name is Bridget Kaplan and I am the Marketing Manager for Caden Security. Caden Security is a cybersecurity solutions provider with over 13 years of experience. We partner with leading vendors around information security, risk management, and compliance. We also offer a turnkey managed security service for helping organizations with third-party risk. Today, we'll be hearing from Joseph Kofa, Systems Engineer from Symantec. Joseph will be providing an in-depth look at Symantec's data center security technology. Before turning it over to Joseph, I wanted to let you know that you will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I will now turn it over to Joseph. Thank you, Bridget. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin. And Just like we said, if there's any questions, go ahead and ask. I'll be happy to answer as we go along here today. So we're going to be talking uh, Symantec uh, Data Center Security. Um, this is a solution that's been around for a long time, for over 10 years, basically. Uh, we've gone through some rebranding recently uh, in the last few years, but uh, we've been solving with this tool. We've been solving customer challenges, again, for over 10-plus uh, years. Uh, when you look at uh, data center security, uh, there's a lot of components to it and a lot of uh, use cases within the solution. Um, what I'm going to do today is to simplify it, is really break it down into what are the components included, how do you determine what goes where, and if you look at a data center uh, from a holistic point of view, I mean, how do you implement layer security from the standpoint of this technology? So that's kind of the, the direction we're going, and I'm hoping that today will be interactive uh, with questions and engagement. Uh, so looking at these uh, data center security, and I will call it DCS for short. Um, again, there are a lot of security layers uh, within. If you look at what I mentioned earlier uh, with uh, solving issues for over 10 plus years, this is what we've been doing. Uh, protecting operating systems, uh, allowing the system to, to still run and do what it needs to do, but protect against all types of attack and harden the OS. Keeping your good configuration intact, so regardless of who's accessing the system, making sure that you understand what changes are happening and have some control over if and when that change happens. Uh, legacy OSs, your XP's, your Windows 2003, uh, if and when we get into the demo, depending on how the conversation goes today, uh, the, the system I intend to use uh, is the 2003 system. And that's one of the use cases of this too, is that if you have older systems that you, maybe you cannot migrate from and you have an application on that still need protection, uh, we can secure the OS and allow you in a protective way to still run that. On, uh, on that legacy OS. So that's one of the use cases. And the same principle we apply to any system you're protecting, but because of how the two is structured, we're able to protect our legacy systems. And then there is your regulation and auditing, which is this passive look of how the system is then used. I will get a lot more into this later. So we're going to be looking at these four aspects um, as part of the discussion today. And I'll also talk about agent security. Uh, we've seen a lot of wave right now with server virtualization. Uh, in the past, today we've seen a huge uh, VDI uh, drive to get those desktops virtualized. Um, and we can secure that. So I'll talk about where our agent of security fits in this space and then talk about uh, our cloud protection. So if you're in Amazon or Azure, uh, we can protect both of these environments. So I'll briefly mention this, but we're going to be heavily focused on the rest of uh, what the solution does. So that's entirely what we do uh, within the data center series stack. And as we go along, I will continue to narrow our scope. All right, so looking at, uh, again, the solution from another view, uh, if you were to purchase, uh, these are the consumable options. So these are what you, these are what you can actually buy, um, the modules within data center security. And the green here is your base. Uh, this is where we're going to start our discussion and then scale up. Uh, this is your hypervisor level security. And then from there, uh, if these same machines are virtualized, you can apply any level of security with these two options. So we'll talk about the green, we'll talk about the yellow, and then we'll get into the red. So we're starting here. Uh, I mentioned that these are the three options that you can purchase for DCS. Uh, a bit includes SEP for VDI, uh, which is not technically part of the DCS stack. But I include this because um, it, it it, even though it's not technically part of this product family, it includes the server solution. So uh, SEP for VDI is a package that includes SEP 
to SEP 14, for example, our income protection, as well as our agentless too. So we include two solutions in this package, and because we have the server included here to protect the VDI boxes, I included it as part of this scope to protect the hypervisor. So we're going to dig a little bit into uh, what we do here as well as what we do on these top layers. And be mindful that everything you see here is the same management platform, so you can start and then scale your security up without making an architecture change. Uh, so going into the agentless security, um, I, I really want to break this conversation apart because what we do at the green is very different than what we do above here with the yellow and red. So we're going to uh, exclusively talk about the green and then get into the other uh, aspects of the solution uh, as we go along. So talking about your base, uh, what do we protect or how do we look at the base? Uh, this is hypervisor level protection. This is covering uh, VMs that exist and anything that could register tomorrow. This is protecting your VDI boxes maybe that exists or anything you can add tomorrow. And then uh, the two security layers that we provide uh, at the hypervisor is either AV or network IPS. Uh, if you're familiar with our endpoint security solution, uh, these are comparable to uh, those two security layers in our endpoints, so your AV layer as well as your network IPS. Uh, both of these we're able to deliver at the hypervisor without installing anything on your guest VM. Uh, to make this work, uh, there are some requirements that have to be met from the, uh, both the VMware side and, and our side. Uh, the VMware is where we hook in, so uh, making sure that you meet the server side requirement is key. Uh, NSX, for example, is, is a key requirement within the server side uh, on the VMware to make sure that you, you're able to protect at the hypervisor. Um, you have a couple of options on how you meet NSX. Uh, again, this is your network and virtualization option within VMware, uh, relatively new within the last years, and uh, it also allows you to do security at the hypervisor. This is our plugin. Uh, this is VMware's first iteration of uh, meeting the server side requirement for agentless security. I kept this in here because for uh, uh, showing uh, the roadmap and the migration path from uh, VShield. Uh, VMware since end of life issue, and if you're looking for visual level, if you have the vision manager and looking for visual level, uh, a comparable level of security, now NSX has a free version. It's called NSX free. This is the default install that allows you now to do AV. When you look at the two security layers, it allows you to do AV on your VM. So just like you could do AV or visual. Now you can do A with the free version. If you wanted to do IPS or add more security at the hypervisor, then some paid option has to be involved. So you'd be looking at a license option for NSX. But this has to be met. This is a hard requirement for us to plug in and provide that agentless uh, security. Um, I'm going to dig a little bit more into, um, and we're still talking about your hypervisor level protection. Uh, you looking at the architecture, you will have a vCenter server. Uh, what may be new uh, in a lot of cases is the introduction of this NSX manager. Uh, this is an OVA you download from NSX, uh, from VMware, I'm sorry, and then uh, set up, connect it to your vCenter. Uh, there's a lot that this box does, and it can be daunting, uh, but all we're looking for from the manager is uh, that you can register this manager to vCenter so we look at these two in pair. Uh, and your requirement is done basically, so we don't require a lot from um, all the extra stuff that NSX provides. Now you look at the environment, um, if you have multiple hosts in a cluster, or if multiple hosts in multiple clusters, uh, you can decide which host to protect in your individual cluster. You could protect them all, or you can selectively protect the host, that is uh, the VMs on the individual host. We don't install in any case anything on your host box uh, directly. We do put a couple of security servers, one is from us, one is from VMware. NSX allows you to install the guest introspection, which is a security service uh, that runs on the host, and you also install appliance. So for each host you're looking to protect, you will have two security services, two appliances essentially running on these hosts. And I will show you these appliances here in a bit. This number is not the total number of VMs we protect across the environment, but the total number we ask you to balance across your individual host machine. So if you don't, I don't see this on the server side. Uh, VDI is where I see. I've seen up to 150 uh, uh, non-persistent VDI sitting on the same host. I've heard. Um, so theoretically, this could be possible, but uh, this is the max per host. So we ask you to keep this number down uh, to around 200 and below. 
appetite. So I'm going to keep building on this. Uh, if you're looking for agentless security, these are the operating systems we support. So it's currently, you can see clearly, is Windows only. Uh, I think it was the last version of NSX where uh, VMware introduced now the, the, the client-side drivers for Linux, and we're looking to add that in our next release. So they basically tell us what's ready for agentless security, and we follow suit. So currently, is Windows only. We can protect Linux, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but if you're looking for hypervisor level AV or IPS in this structure, uh, it's currently Windows only. All right, so I'm going to stop here, and uh, we talked a little bit about the, the agentless security, talk a little bit about the architecture that it protects both uh, servers, workstation, and, and, and VDI sitting on top of VM, we talk about the server side requirements. I want to jump in and add some pictures and color to some of what we've been talking about. So what I'm going to do is I will drag my uh, remote session onto the screen. You guys should be able to see it. Uh, double check that I'm signed in. And we'll connect some of the dots we just talked about. So what I'm doing and what I didn't show, and I'll probably do that right now, is a little bit of the architecture slide before I log in here. Uh, let me come back. So I'll just discuss it. I don't want to jump around. Uh, so I'm remoting into a, a Windows box, which is my management server. Management is Windows only. The back end for this server is SQL. It can be local or remote. Uh, very, very similar architecture as far as uh, 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 management or endpoint protection. You have a server database uh, and it's Windows SQL backend. I'm logging into my management console for, and this is both agent and agentless security. So you will see components of both within the console. Uh, I mentioned NSX as a server side requirement. Uh, you will set up this management OVA. Uh, give it networking information so it talks to the machine and then register it to your vCenter. I mean, there's a lot in here, but this is all we ask you to do after you, you set up this NFX manager is connected to your vCenter server. Um, this allows us then to do the rest of our configuration. Um, I mentioned there are two appliances that sit on the host. We provide one and uh, VMware provides the other. There's nothing installed in Get Your Security that these two layers. Both of these appliances are deployed within VMware. We provide ours, which if you look at our console, and that's usually your starting point, where you tell us about your vCenter server and your NSX manager, and then import your security appliance. Now, this is your virtual agent, basically. Uh, it's an OVA, come to the install. You will import, typically you install an OVA directly in VMware. Uh, with this up, uh, uh, structure, you import the OVA, and then we push it out to vCenter for installation. So at this point, you're ready to install it. So two things you would push out. First, make your appliance available, and then also if you intend to use or whatever policy, security policies you intend to use within uh, VMware, uh, those policies will also need to be published. And I will show you uh, what that looks like here. Uh, if you look at your security policies, you can see the status. There are three different statuses uh, visible for your security policy. Uh, what's available in NSX or in vCenter, those are your published policies. What's not available and what you've modified and can you know, update if you needed to. So as you modify, you can, you can add this update or push out whatever updates you have to vCenter. These policies will be available as I'm configuring. So two things, push out your appliance, get your policies in place, and then the rest of your configuration will be done in vCenter. Um, and so if you have separate security uh, uh, admins from your vCenter administrators, uh, there may be, this may be a joint effort where um, you know, you make sure you have your configuration here. You're not technically managing here. Uh, even though you're creating your groups, linking your groups to policies, we will capture what you're doing. You can do exclusively. Once you have your groups and policies set up in here, uh, you can manage from our console. So this is not your management interface, but it's where, because of the integration of NSX, is where you define what you're doing as far as security. Okay, so we have our appliance pushed out. Uh, this is the appliance. You can see that uh, the, uh, the OVA import and push makes the appliance available. So the next thing you would do is to verify that it's here, and this is your guest introspection. So these two services will need to be installed on every host that you want to protect. Our installation with the NSX, so uh, set up your service deployment, and if you have multiple hosts in your cluster, you can push out uh, the two services to as many hosts that you would like to protect. This satisfies your AV requirement. 
Uh, if you also wanted to do ITS, you will need to prepare the host, and this allows your individual hosts or collectively to route traffic to us so that we can scan all those definition set uh, to make ITS level detection. Uh, the security layers within, I'll just break this down while we're here. The security layers within the tool, you have your AV, which includes your real-time scan. So if something gets open actively, we detect it, as well as your schedule. So if you want to run periodic scans, if you're doing that right now and want to continue running your sweeping scans, this will do that as well. So it will queue up machines and scan them as well as protect them real-time. So we're looking both in line as what's coming over the network as well as what's coming on the file system, and we can go out and check. So we have our appliance in place. We have our both IPS ready. We have our AV ready. Uh, and then from there, you're defining your security, I'm sorry, you're defining your security groups and policies under your survey composer. Uh, if you think about our all familiar with our endpoint security tool, our uh, semantic endpoint security, uh, there's a clients and policies tab where you create your groups and policies. If you look at this architecture, you're actually creating your security groups directly in NSX and linking the policies you publish to that security group, which is what I've done here. I'm not going to go into too much details here, but I wanted to at least show you what the security groups look like. If you're interested in protecting VMs, this tells you how you can target within your structure what you want to protect, how you want to separate your VDI from everything else. Um, in a lot of VDI conversations I go into customers with, um, they have the VDI all in the same cluster. So if you're creating this group to protect server or VDI, give it a descriptive name, uh, tell us what makes this group unique, and you have a couple of ways to do that. Uh, the first option, the dynamic membership, is going to give you a uh, OS name, a few different options if you're using tag. Uh, you can use this to filter out uh, machines into this group. Uh, but another option is the, the, the objects to include, which gives you a lot more uh, as far as targets within the VMR. Uh, if all of your systems were in the same cluster, I mentioned VDI, that's pretty common. Uh, select your cluster, add that to your security group, and now you're protecting that cluster. Uh, if you notice here, uh, you can target pretty high within VMware. So if you're at a very high level and there are systems at that level you don't want to protect or for whatever reason don't want to target, they can be included maybe even at the VM level uh, as part of an exclusion to that target that you've set up there. So very simple for the group creation. Tell us what it is what you want to protect, what exclusions from the VM level you don't want, or what you don't want to protect, and you have a security group. Um, VMware don't create our policies. We publish them here. Uh, and the policy is already available. So all you do uh, if you assign your security policy is uh, go through the drop down and find that policy and make sure that is a, uh, you're selecting the correct policy and assigning it to the, uh, the group. This is the plugin for AV within NSX. Uh, there are a few different options. Uh, you have the a uh, guest introspection, which is your AV service. You have a firewall. If you look at the firewall, it's blank. We're not providing firewall service. We are providing uh, IPS, and you can do both directions, which is what I'm looking at here. Traffic from NN source to my security groups, and this can be specified based on groups of machines if you want to be even more narrow in what you're looking at, as well as uh, traffic from all my machines to any outside source, so you can detect in both directions. I have this policy assigned. Uh, I'm just right-clicking and applying to a security group. Uh, both the security group and po uh, policies tab will give you a view into your security status. So you see this is apply. It has AV. It has two IPS uh, uh, policies looking in both directions. If you look at a group view, similarly, you will see uh, some of your protection stru uh, structures. So policies are applied, uh, AV is applied, no firewall, IPS in both directions, full VMs protected. You don't have to always look in here for management information. We capture that through synchronization. So if you just created uh, this VDI group, for example, uh, when synchronization happens or if you force synchronization, uh, you will see that now you've created from our manager you've created a, a security group. Uh, let's see. Let's say this is a group that was just created. I'm going to switch back now. We've essentially done of what we can do for create, uh, configuration in here. And this basically ends the process of getting to where you have security in place. Uh, the rest is just verifying from the management that you have that. And then what I'm going to do is actually show a brief test uh, showing AV um, detection for both file system and then IPS, and we'll look at the reporting and then build from there. So 
All right, so we switch back to security groups from the virtual machine. And we just remind you, we just created a VDI security group here that potentially this uh, um, system may not know about if it's a new security group and we can capture that through synchronization. So let's see. It's taking a long time. I'm on the wrong tab, that's why. All right. So earlier we saw that it was just VDI and we had that group created early in NSX. If I run a synchronization, whatever change or whatever new group was created, we will capture and that will be reflected here. So you can see your security status and what you're doing, uh, not just by going NSX, but from our console. Uh, similar information you saw, we have AV on four machines, none unprotected. Um, three have IP, or four of them have IPS, non unprotected with uh, IPS, and then both of them have both AV and IPS, and we're going to test this here. Um, I haven't shown you guys my back end environment yet. I have a couple of clusters, and you've seen glimpses of this throughout the presentation, but I have a couple of clusters. This is my management cluster, and this is you know, where I'm protecting my VMs. I do have one machine in my management cluster just to show VDI protection. Um, and uh, these are the two appliances. So here's the VMware box. A lot of times I get uh, questions from customers about what load this box introduced to a VM, and you can see that here. So if you look at the variable impact of all the different agents on your individual guests, now you're limiting that to a couple of services, and you can see how much that requires from what VMware asks. There's a purpose-built box, as well as we're a little bigger, but what we ask you to provision on the host, and that satisfies the requirement. I'm going to open one of these boxes that we said we saw from a report that's protected, and we will test ICAR. Uh, this is a free uh, open source. I shouldn't say free. Uh, open source, um, not a real malware, but fake malware where uh, every vendor with AV signatures should have definitions for. And ICAR didn't load. That's interesting. Try that again. Let's try another box. There. So I'm at icar.org. That's the site uh, for testing. And it's loading. There we go. Uh, if you scroll down at the download link, uh, you can test both uh, SSL and uh, regular traffic. I'm going to open both of these. And you will see uh, the, the pop up here, all the, the uh, extra window here, those are IPS detections, and you see as we open in this, we're not allowing, allowing the files to write to the file system and we detect them in line. Both of these detections are on the management side. So if you look, for example, you see a source destination port, et cetera, in both of these blocks, and then we didn't allow these files to be downloaded. I'm going to switch uh, to my monitor. Uh, so you see that as these, uh, just like in an enterprise level tool, as we are making these detections, you have them uh, in front of you, categorized both from a malware standpoint as well as your IPS detection. And I'll show you briefly what this looks like, and we can shift gears here. So we see there's a real-time threat. I mentioned that you do have a uh, real-time plus scan. So if this was a scheduled scan that you ran, it will tell you here we went and looked, and here is what we found. iCart attempted to be downloaded. It was blocked. You see your timestamp. Uh, the source is going to tell you what VM was impacted, policies, what policy you have applied. So with that anything on that guest, we're still able to go to the VMware tools if the service side requirement is met and you tell us what to protect, then I'll still be able to protect those VMs, both from looking at what's coming in on the network as well as what's written to the file system. So, so that's your AV, um, kind of your AV coverage and what we do at the hypervisor. Um, we're about to shift gear and talk about a different kind of protection, a different level of protection all within the same management interface. I like to cover AV first, so that you can ask your simple, that's your base, um, and then you can scale out security from there to machines that may need more throughout the network. So if we're you know, good with AV for now, uh, we're going to shift gears and talk about other components, other layers of security within the tool. All right. Okay, so uh, we talked about data center security having an um, AV component, protect not the hypervisor. So completely different mode here, where now we're about to talk about not agentless security, but within the same framework, we're about to talk about an agent that gets installed 
for various reasons, and we talk about what those reasons are. So there may be use case where you say, I want to protect everything I have, but not all machines are created equal, and not all machines may have the same level of security requirements. So those that require more of something else, this can be a complementary tool to what you're doing at the AV level. It's not AV, clearly. We've talked we said talk about AV uh, here in a little bit. Um, it doesn't scan, so what we're about to talk about is no scan, it's not definition based, uh, it's not storing much on your system in terms of updates, there's no updates there, uh, it's using host based intrusion and detection uh, uh, technologies, and we'll talk about what that means in this particular context of the solution. Um, so we're moving up, we cover the base, we talk about protecting VMware, now we talk everything else is going to be putting an agent on, and the first level we're talking about is uh, visibility, understanding what's happening with individual machines. Uh, if you take any server, maybe a web server, a server in a pub, uh, DMZ, a critical server internally, um, Having an AV2 on there, an endpoint two that's protecting the file system, looking at heuristics, looking at different components of how what's happening there, making those detections is great. Uh, but there are a lot of attacks we see specifically against servers that a lot of those endpoint tools may not necessarily consider security events. They're doing what they're built to do, but they're not looking in areas where we see common areas where we see servers getting attacked. So let's say you have a critical box, regardless of what it is or where it's sitting, um, somebody log into that box. I mean, would you consider that a security event? What if they escalate the privilege right after the login? Is that also a security event? Try to copy a critical file, change the OS, all of those things, even though a um, typical AV solution may see that as, hey, this is just regular something that should happen on the server. We're monitoring that from this standpoint and telling you, hey, this critical box, here is exactly what's happening. If somebody just log in, escalated touch a file they shouldn't, change a config file, and now they're trying to copy it. So you get to see if it's a true attack beginning from the idea side, you get to see that attack chain and get to see what's building and what's happening. Um, this, all these capabilities that can come with an agent and IDF is passive. It's not going to block in any of these categories what's happening, but it's going to tell you real time, here is what's happening on this box. You may want to go investigate, slap somebody's hand, prevent that from happening, maybe through an out-of-band method. We can, of course, do it, but if you're only doing IDF, if you're looking at only the yellow layer, and this can be purchased, remember, all of these are exclusive uh, uh, options to the solution, so you can purchase monitoring exclusively. Uh, if you only had that option, you're just looking at real-time visibility for both Windows and Unix systems um, across your environment. Um, this also satisfies, and I'll go a little bit more into this, but it's also satisfied PCI, and I talk a lot about uh, a lot of financial customers about this. Uh, 11.5 is the, the usual initial driver where people are trying to meet the file system integrity monitoring. Uh, solution from the IDS side will meet uh, the file system monitoring, but it does a lot more for PCI than 11.5, so uh, be mindful of that. Not just on the detection side, but both um, the agent will provide you a lot of the PCI compliance requirements. All right, so uh, before I'm going to go and jump into the red, but before I go into the hard, and I'm going to give just like I did before, we talk about agentless security. We're talking about an agent now that monitors or hardened. We just talk about monitoring, and I'm going to show what that looks like. So just like I did before, I'm going to drag my uh, screen back on. And this time, we'll come back here, but we have a, a policy editor. And if you look at the, the, uh, the slide I showed earlier, I showed you the detection list of uh, what you could monitor. That loosely matches uh, what I'm calling our baseline. Uh, we have been doing this for quite a while, so we understand what it takes to monitor a Windows box if you gave us a Windows system, and what it takes to uh, monitor a Unix or an IX platform. Uh, you don't have to follow our recommendations. Uh, if you wanted to take a blank policy, IDS policy, and only build your own custom monitors, and I'll talk about the areas we look in, you can. Uh, but we give you a baseline if you want a starting point for monitoring uh, these areas. I showed PCI earlier. Um, this isn't branded PCI, but by default, it's look to, looking to monitor your core OS files, your config files. So it's doing things that PCI, for example, will ask you to monitor. These are your baseline. Uh, if you remember uh, the slide I just showed, uh, this loosely match what you saw on there. So your logon, who's logging on and off, uh, changes to Active Directory, uh, user group, uh, and this is your escalation, user group changes, uh, looking at common areas uh, that may be attack on the system. 
who's connecting what device. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty extensive look, and this is customizable. So you could go to this list and say, oh, maybe there's this custom check I want to do, and it can be in a number of categories. Uh, it can be a file. Um, it can be NT, and we'll collect that if it's a, a custom event that you want us to let you know what's going on. We'll generate that event and let you know here. Uh, I, I'm going to, uh, because of time, uh, usually I demo these separately, but because of time, I'm going to do one use case that show both detection and uh, prevention. So we talk about ideas, but when I actually show the, the ideas and the uh, use case, we'll link them both and then look at the uh, report from there. Uh, so I'm coming back here. Um, to the policy base, a couple of things I will open up, uh, and then we can switch over and talk about prevention. We'll come back and test this, of course, uh, but a couple of things I want to show you from the baseline. Who's making account changes? Um, all of these uh, uh, options here, these are sensors on the client. Uh, some are collecting NT information. We have a file sensor collecting file information. We're looking at the registry. We have a separate collector for that. So to get file information, for example, we don't depend on NT events, but if it's an NT event, we'll tell you, hey, here is how we're categorizing that. So you can always see how we're collecting what makes a lock account lock. So we're looking at what events associated. So similarly, if you have a critical security NT event that you want close to real, real time or close to real time, this is the last step. You can actually add it um, to the template as you need to. So who's logging on, AD changes, et cetera. FIM is a common one. Uh, this, uh, uh, the default will look at your, your sys file. Um, we'll look at the OS core and monitor that because a lot of compliance requires you to know what's going on uh, with the operating system core. If you do anything uh, different uh, than what we specify, that can be added here. So you can use the baseline or do your own custom rule. I have a custom uh, um, um, use case created here where FIM is the most common use case for IDS or file integrity monitoring. And so I have a file integrity monitoring use case where I'm looking at creation, deletion, check some difference so I get the hash, uh, file differences, um, and then specifying the path here, which is my important stuff. So whatever happens here, I want to see real time. So we'll see this use case here in a little bit. Um, so what we've talked about so far is the ability to understand in various categories based on our baseline we provide uh, what's happening on your system and being able to act on that through, either through, I'm sorry, go back a little bit, either through out of band or through our prevention option. So know what's going on and act you know, as you need. Now, it's great to know, but um, I think it's better to be able to prevent and still know, and that's where our advanced offering comes into play. Uh, we have AV in place. We're protecting at the minimum everything that exists or could register to vCenter tomorrow for those critical devices that require real-time visibility in those areas we talk about or require FIM or file integrity monitoring for compliance. We satisfy that through our monitoring addition. And now we're looking to scale up. I mean, what if we could actually harden and prevent or limit the system to only do what that system was built to do? That's where we get into our hardening feature. Uh, both the red and the yellow is the same agent, so you're not installing something separate for this or this. Agentless, same agent satisfy your monitoring or your hardening requirement. Okay, so building on that, um, we look now, we, we talk about IDS, we're talking about IPS, which is our prevention. We don't just want to sit and passively know, now we're starting to block. Uh, blocking can be scary, uh, it can be tricky. Uh, before you go into blocking, I mean, one business to happy, one business to run. So before you go into blocking, uh, we want to understand what, we, what is the profile of this box, what's running, what applications are installed, what are the primary role of this system, what is, uh, and how can we define that primary role? How do we understand the main application running? What's the workflow of that application? Uh, these are our kernel drivers, so we see what's happening with the application. We see what file access, reg, network, uh, and we can even wrap that up. All, of, all those access attempts into a policy for you and say, for this primary application on your server, here is what it needs to function. We're going to sandbox it, we're going to isolate it, protect the OS, and only allow that specific role to happen. Everything else is excluded. So whatever is not part of that initial security profile that you learn and understand and now you're enforcing doesn't happen, including the zero day or any other outside threat. So OS is protected. We're looking at network, looking at file registering, how other aspects of the system could be used. I mentioned sandboxing. Uh, that's at the core of uh, how, uh, on the IPS side, how this technology works and what it does. Um, you can, today sandboxing is common, so you can go out there and find, easily find a sandboxing tool. 
Uh, when you look at sandboxing itself, there, there are some unique challenges with it. Um, usually when we, we whitelist in our sandboxing, uh, we do, I would say whitelisting instead of sandboxing, it's like closest to the concept we're talking about. Uh, when we're whitelisting, we are, um, we're, we're doing it on a good day. We're saying we trust this application either because we trust the vendor we created on our own, and we're going to allow this application unrestricted access every day. Usually it's you know, to the entire system, and it's on a good or bad day. So let's say that custom application or that good application tomorrow becomes a bad application because of vulnerability or whatever associated with that. Now you have the challenge of going back and redefining what that application does or what level of access it should have on a box. We don't do that. When we whitelist, we first want to understand what we whitelist, and I call it protective whitelisting. What is this application built to do? How can we understand and only allow that level of access and nothing more? So tomorrow, today is all good. Tomorrow when that application becomes compromised, vulnerable, et cetera, we know exactly what the impact is of that application. So not, it's not going to go outside of whatever sense we've created. So we whitelist, allowing only exactly what should happen. And not just application, this applies to users and administrators as well. Um, if you have a SIM2, actually before we, we talk about uh, uh, reporting and monitoring, I want to talk about a uh, demo of both of these concepts. We've talked about uh, monitoring and passively knowing. We talked about hardening and whitelisting and understanding what's happening. I'm going to show, talk about um, demo or pre prevention, and then we can talk about, um, we test both of them actually. So earlier we looked at our detection with our baseline. Uh, similarly, if you're doing prevention, remember from the slide you could do you could use these exclusively. So you could only do detection or prevention. And so we have these separate here in our policy editing. I do have a Windows 2003 system um, that I have a policy applied to from the prevention side. And so I wanted to you know, discuss the prevention use case a little bit more before we test it. Uh, this is your policy. Uh, one of the first things you do is make sure that when, if you're going to work with a, a security policy that is turned off, uh, this puts your policy in a, oh, I can move this down, move this over, this way up, there we go. This puts your policy in a, what we call learning or profiling mode. Uh, in either case, what is on or off, we see what's happening on the box. If it's on, we stop what we should and what the policy said we should. If it's off, we tell you here is what's happening and do something with this profile data. Um, and there are multiple ways we can collect that and put it back in the policy, but understanding what's happening in your system uh, is the beginning uh, actually to getting some enforcement in place on the prevention side. We have default policies you can pick um, or build your own. If you build your own, you will walk through these earlier policy settings uh, to define what you're trying to do. If you create it, uh, if you pick one, it will have all of these defined uh, for you. Uh, so I'm going to quickly just look at uh, the options within here and then we test this. Uh, your protection strategy is overall how you're targeting uh, this system. Uh, basic is just going to block software install and keep us intact. Harden is your most common policy. It's going to protect your OS, keep us intact, and allow you to customize how you protect your application. All of these templates are the same. You can tune up or down. It makes sense to start closest to what you're trying to accomplish. Again, this is our most common. If you have a system that's a true single-use box, or clearly you can define what application or what that system does, or we can help you do that, um, protector whitelisting may be the way to go where we capture the app. We say, here's the only thing that should happen. Everything else can have a good day. So uh, if you really wanted to lock down and be most restrictive, whitelisting is the way to go. But here, because we've picked a hardened strategy, uh, we're going to go with the hardened harden policy. So we have a strategy, and that strategy is hard, which means it's going to lock down the system. At some point in the lifetime of a box, after you've locked it down, somebody has to make a change, and we'll make provisions for that. Uh, if you have any of these applications that you're using to patch, um, that can be specified uh, as a change management tool, and we have some of these built in. Uh, if you have your own custom, it can also be added as a custom application. Uh, you can also add trusted users, so it's not just application. If you have a specific user or group, uh, that's responsible for patching that can be added here as that exception. So we have a strategy that protects. We have an exception for uh, making changes. Um, understanding what's happening on the box. So unless you turn this off, we will capture what applications are on your system. So it's easy to make. Uh, some may require granular toning. Some may require uh, just generic up and down, generic uh, on or off. Uh, but we'll tell you here is uh, what we found on your server. 
Um, a while ago, I came in and there was a 7-zip vulnerability. I do run 7-zip on a lot of my systems here, um, and I was trying to figure out how to address this. At the time, there was no patch for it, and so it was a zero day. I came in, um, didn't want to install 7-zip, so I wanted to keep using it as a tool. So what I could, what I did very quickly was uh, browse what applications were on. Um, I don't know if it's on this list, uh, but add it, for example. So if you add, uh, let's pick anything, uh, the market Trader. I uh, added to the list, and now I can set control. If this is 7-zip, uh, if I don't want that to ever run again until that's remediated, I can be set to deny, and this you know, application never runs. Uh, so that's how I was able to address that until they came up with a patch for it. But the idea is we tell you here is what we found, and you can actually enforce or take action on that. Uh, we're getting close to time here. Uh, so what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is, uh, let's see. I'm going to show, this is, uh, I have this system in the 2003 server locked down. This is the custom application that is allowed to run. And so I have that uh, separated here from everything else. So it has its own rules and policies and access uh, rules. Um, everything else is, is uh, will follow whatever this overall strategy that I have for this policy. So I have isolated my application. Uh, administrative accounts are de-escalated. Uh, everything follows whatever security policy you have in place. And I have a custom, let me go into my global policy. You saw earlier with the file rule where I had uh, a path that I was saying, um, whoever access that I want to monitor and I want to know real time. But what I'm doing on the backside with prevention also is uh, not allowing anybody to access that source. So you have to be a specific user and an administrator to be able to access that important path that I have uh, defined. When I get to the system for prevention, when I bring that 2003 back, I will show the escalation. Um, I'm going to come back to my application rules. So I want to show here that I have an older version of uh, Internet Explorer running, and I don't want that to run on the system. Chrome is okay, but it's not allowed to make outbound connection. So you can have applications running, even have uh, control over the level of access and what to do on the box. Um, this app, uh, this policy has been profiled, uh, it's been toned, and it's applied to the system. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cancel this. Uh, and we drag that Windows box. Uh, yes. No. And we drag that Windows system back onto the screen and uh, test it again. So I'm, I'm going to do a couple of users. So I'm going to use a console session. Uh, so now I'm, I'm logging in. You saw from the policy, only administrators are allowed to touch my important stuff. I'm going to log in as a local administrator that's not specified as a user that can access that path. And we'll show the description of its account and uh, policy enforcement as well. All right, so I'm in. I'm an actual domain administrator, for that matter, not a local. Uh, I'm going to launch IE, not an approved application here, and as an administrator, I understand that that attempt happened. Uh, Chrome is okay, but right now I'm not allowing it to make any outbound connection. Uh, so you see that block. Uh, let's see. But my main application is allowed to run, which is my what this server is built to do. So you can still isolate that application, give it what it needs. Uh, it may not run under this user, but give it what it needs uh, to exclusion of everything else. So. All right, so I'm in, and I can do any number of things. This application is approved. Uh, I'm going to go down. I've talked about OS Core and making sure that nobody's changing down here. I'll just go into Windows 632 uh, and try to delete something real quick. So I have this at all of these. If this is a attempt, maybe I got in here as a regular user, elevate my privilege. I have the login attempt. At all of these changes, whatever's happening is interaction. I have these in front of me. If you have alerting set up on the management side, you're receiving these alerts as these tampering happen or whatever's been used or whatever's happened on the box. I'm going to log off real quickly here. 
uh, and look back in. Uh, what I didn't show was uh, access to that important stuff app. And what we expect to see here is that since this user was not part of that uh, group, that I have this access attempt. So I'm going to log off. And I'll log in as an administrator, a different administrator that's entitled. And we'll look at monitoring and wrap this up. Okay, so now I'm going to go after the same path. Different user, all the same, uh, 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 everything we talked about apply, but now I'm entitled to access this and uh, see what's here. And whatever edits made here is captured uh, on the management side. So I want to pick that up. All right, so. Same thing, uh, whatever is, uh, security profiles in force, regardless of the administrator, you still respect the policy that's in place. All right, so I'm going to switch back to monitor and let's see what's been going on on those boxes. And then one more slide and we're done. All right, so a couple of things we saw. We saw some prevention events. Actually, I'm going to start with detection real quick. Uh, There we go. All right, so I'm looking at prevention. We saw my Internet Explorer launch. It was denied because I have a policy set to uh, uh, deny that. Uh, my important stuff file was edited. I'm watching that and only allowing administrators to edit that with an audit. So you can see that uh, if you look at source, you see that the administrator was in there uh, editing that file. Um, so what captured you know, file changes, uh, access to them, application run. This can be profile data. So if you see an event in here, maybe that you want to allow, you can very easily change that action directly, either put it away for audit or change the, the whatever you see. Uh, front end work, understanding what's happening, profiling, allowing those things to happen uh, before turning the process, the, the policy on, uh, is typically how you would do this. So go from understanding to enforce it. All right, so uh, let's see, last slide here uh, before we close this out. Let's get through. If you have a SIM tool, we can send information directly to it. Uh, very low uh, usage, but and in color comparison. But what I wanted to get to here, uh, in just interest of time, is a couple of things. Uh, customers are running Docker. So if you have uh, Docker in the environment, we can protect at the uh, Docker host, uh, protect whatever is running on top of that. So it's something to be mindful of. Uh, this kind of wraps it all together, that uh, the concepts we talk about. If you're virtualized, we can, at the hypervisor level, protect all of those VMs, Windows only right now. Uh, machines that are virtualized or not that require monitoring or hardening, we can put an agent on to accomplish that. NSX is on the line uh, uh, for your agent of security. Uh, if you're virtualized, we talk about how we can satisfy the virtual requirement, if it's VMware specifically. If you cloud with Amazon or Azure, uh, everything we talked about with the agent applies if you were cloud. We can uh, natively protect your machines you have in the cloud either by monitoring or by hardening those machines using our cloud workload protection. So same concept with IDS, IPS, just natively in Amazon, detecting and applying policies as necessary. Uh, last, last one here. I want to talk about this uh, uh, last slide. Um, I've been talking about this for some time now, and last year, actually, I got to go to this event. So I sat there on the second day and watched as frustration level grew with people trying to exploit the agented aspect of this tool. We talk about IDS and IPS, particularly IPS. A little bit about the setup, we take out these basic systems. So the Windows 2000, 2003, the RAL, the CentOS, these were base OS installed. No compensating control, no patch, no AV. So we didn't have anything else protecting these. Uh, we took our default policy, uh, hardened policy, put it on there. So this, when you saw the policy structure earlier from the prevention side, 
out of the box hard and put it on there, set up different targets. Uh, the Windows 2000 or 2003 box, one of these was running IS5. We put a password file on the desktop. We tried to make this uh, uh, solution exploitable as best as possible. Because what you will find usually is you have to give an attack or fighting chance with this tool, especially with the agent on the prevention side. We were able to monitor, we saw all the different types of attack. And not, it used to be 5K, we updated $10,000. And uh, last year, again, once again, we bought in the back the price. So. Uh, very stellar records. Again, some of supposedly the best out there uh, using just out of box policy. We will take a system and enforce exactly what you want and really prevent that against uh, being attacked. So protect your base, gain great visibility, scaling to hardening as you need to. Not right, basic data to security. And if you're in the cloud, a lot of the monitoring and hardening concepts can apply there as well. And I'll be happy to dig into that conversation as needed. Okay, so this is what we have. I'm going to wrap up here, um, see if there's any questions, and uh, we can start taking those and uh, going through and answering at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joseph. Um, we're going to begin starting the questions right now. We received three. The first okay. one is, what is NSX, and does all of DCS require NSX? So NSX is a, a VMware a networking and virtualization layer. Um, and if you look at all of the, the uh, DCX Stack everything that's included. Uh, the only re requirement for NSX is if you are doing agentless security. So if you were putting an agent on a physical or virtual box, no NSX here. Uh, if you wanted to do agentless, that's how a hook into VMware. So that service side requirement has to be met for the grain. Very important. Great. Okay. Number two. How is the DCS in-house agent different from the cloud protection? I didn't go too much into our cloud. Um, I did mention that uh, if you're in Amazon or Azure, we can still provide the same level of functions. Uh, the difference there is if you're in the cloud, you're not, you don't own the management infrastructure. I just showed you a Windows box that I log in, manage the SQL on the back, making sure that's good. Uh, the cloud option in, in both of those cloud platforms, we own the entire management infrastructure, so we updating, et cetera. Uh, but on top of that, uh, if you look at uh, some of our earlier discussion on how this agent works, uh, you, you install your manager, you push out your agents, and you profile and you harden. If you translate that to the cloud, even though it's similar principles, it's a little different where when you sign up, sign up for your cloud service in each one of those individual uh, 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 services, Amazon or Azure, uh, and you set us up, we, gain, we, we, we see what's there. So first thing we tell you is, here are all of your machines, you know, your, your load balancers, your subnets, and all the machines that are in each of these categories. We'll also tell you the security status, which you don't get from the in-house because of different architecture. Amazon allow us, because of the infrastructure, to see these things where we tell you, hey, here are your machines, and here is more importantly the protection status. These have agents on. These don't have agents on. These may have policies apply or not. So you get to kind of get a good picture, which you wouldn't get from the in-house or because of Amazon. Another thing you don't get with the in-house, which you gain, which is great from the, the, the cloud uh, uh, integration is, uh, you saw from the in-house that we can scan applications. So we want to know what's on your systems if you chose. You know, you can turn that off. In the cloud, as we're scanning these applications, we now we add another step, which is a service typically that you pay for from Symantec. We're, we're telling you contextually what we know about these applications, not just on the trust or not trust level, but specifically if there are vulnerabilities associated with those apps. So we scan, we say, hey, you may want to address these or you know you maybe you know they will want to cry tomorrow. So the idea there is to not just tell you hey here's what you have, but uh, these may be vulnerable, you may want to address that. So um, adding our deep not our deep site service is also included with our cloud option. So we're still doing IDS, understanding what's happening, we're still doing ITS, but we own the management, we tell you contextually what applications are there and we can natively just discover and tell you hey here's your overall security status. So similar technology more enhancement and more cloud native uh, function. Great. And the last question, can you run DCS agent and agent list at the hypervisor? You can. Um, for a given system, uh, let's say you have a, a web server, for example, that 
virtualized or not, your domain controller is virtualized, whatever that is. Uh, if you have an agent, um, if you don't have an agent installed for AV, protecting that as hypervisor, you know, it's in a server group and you have an AV policy apply, and that system also needs, that AV isn't going to guarantee that nobody goes in and steals your domain database. It doesn't care if somebody targets your domain database. Uh, if you have a prevention policy on that policy that looks like your domain database or critical aspect of the system that AV doesn't meet. So they can't complement each other. Different use case, the monitor invisibility, AV isn't going to give you that. So you're protecting your file system with uh, your scans, et cetera. And then on top of that, for system that needed, you really either uh, have an agent on that monitoring or hardening those boxes. So they can play together for different use cases or different roles, different reasons. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Understanding Semantics Data Center Security. If you have any other questions, please contact me, Bridget Kaplan, at bkaplan at cadensecurity.com. On behalf of Cadence Security and Semantic, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.